Uh, up next, we have Jeff Peterson with Heartland Farm Partners. They provide grain marketing service to growers. And he's also assistant professor of practice at UNL. As Brad said, he was just teaching this morning. So really glad to have him. All right. So, no, thank you, John. And, and thank you to have the chance to come in. I always love uh, having the chance to talk to Talk to everybody about the markets, and, and as you stated, John, I, I was I do also teach at University of Nebraska. Teach a couple classes, a grain merchandising class, and that was a class that I was in this morning, talking to the students out of our commodity trading room about how the commercial grain traders, how do they use the commodity markets to manage price risk? How do they physically go ahead and make money with that? And then <coughs> do also uh, teach a advanced grain marketing class. And in that class, it's all about how do we build a marketing plan? How do we use crop insurance? How do we use break-evens? How do we know when to physically make grain sales? And then what happens once we make our grain sales if, if all of a sudden conditions change and we need to somehow adjust? So it's, it's great. Uh, my, my background, grew up on a farm northeast Nebraska, up at Lyons, Nebraska. So been involved in agriculture all the way, uh, you know, ever since I, I grew up. And, had a chance to work for Cargill, manage grain elevators for them across North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and then back into Nebraska. And so a great experience with them, and, and, and it's been a lot of fun. But uh, part of the main thing that we do is, we, you know, as Heartland Farm Partners, we spend time uh, focusing on the grain markets and helping farmers make marketing decisions. So you've got all my contact information up here on the screen. We do put out quite a bit of contact on, I guess I still have it marked as Twitter on there, but it's uh, X. And so if you're interested in taking that information in that way, that's a great way to physically do it. We also do have some free commentary that you can get by going to our website, heartlandfarmpartners.com. And if you're interested in learning about the markets, you definitely can go ahead and go there. We really want to keep it uh, very informal today. We also want to just kind of dig in. And, and we're going to hit it in kind of three different areas. I want to start off and just kind of paint a picture and walk along with you and kind of show you what does the world grain trends look like? What are those countries we need to be watching? What's going on in the big picture? And then from there, we'll swoop down and get a little bit lower view. We'll talk about, well, what's going on with these markets currently? And, and what are some of the things we need to be watching on? And then we'll finish up talking about one of the ways that we can physically use um, the technicals, using the charts to make some decisions. And, and I'm going to touch on soybeans today. But, uh, but it just as easily could be used on, on corn or on wheat also. So just taking a look at the big picture, I always like to start here. It kind of helps us uh, understand what's going on. And let me unpack a few things here. Um, right across here in the blue, that's the production. That's the world corn production and domestic demand from 1990 through 2023. And each of these years, let me unpack that a little bit. What that notes is the crop year. And you heard Brad talk a little bit about that in the last session. The crop year for corn starts on September 1st. So we're in the 2023 crop year. Starts on September 1st of 2023 and goes through August 31st of 2024. Then I've also laid out here on this uh, green line, basically domestic consumption. So that's what we're using internally. Not what we're exporting out, but that's what we're using internally. And then over here, we've got our units here are in in thousands of metric tons. And keep in mind, a metric ton is 2,204.623 pounds. So that gives you an idea just as a conversion. What you'll notice overall is that we continue to increase on our production across the world, which we'd expect. Our consumption also does increase. But what I've highlighted for you up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll notice we've got a gap. Now, gaps don't happen that often, but let's talk about what that means. What that's telling us right in there is that's where we physically were using more than what we were physically producing. And as you'd expect, in years where we have that, what that does is that causes us to draw down stocks. Our stocks overall, our excess stocks across the world become smaller. And as you can imagine, that causes prices then to take off and go higher. And But what you'll notice in here is that we are coming back in and we are increasing. We are physically increasing our amount of production in relation to what our consumption is. Now, there's been a few other times right back in here. You'll notice in here from 2000 through 2004, we had another time in there. And 
interesting enough, we talk a lot about China, what happened during that period, what filled in the gap there, because we didn't have real high prices back then, but basically what happened back then is China was in the process of coming into WTO, World Trade Organization, and they physically started exporting out some of their excess stocks. So they kind of filled the void in there during that time frame, so we didn't get that big run up in price. Now overall, as we move into soybeans, so that was corn, we move into beans. You notice on the bean side, domestic consumption there is in orange, production across the world's in blue. Same thing, we've got our crop years across here. And you'll notice, even though it's not labeled, that last one out there is 2023. You'll notice we continue to work higher. Now, those same years, if you look back on corn that we had situations where our domestic consumption was higher than what our production was, we did not see that happen over on the soybean side. And the main reason just gets to be how we're balanced in world production. As we'll go deeper into this, you'll see that because of South America, or South America between Brazil and Argentina, they're producing more than what physically we are. Uh, ultimately, it gives us really pretty well balanced a, a couple different major areas where that production is happening. So we don't quite have the risks that we do on the corn side. As we dig in and look a little bit deeper now, so we, we looked at the big picture production and domestic consumption, but now we need to really fully understand who are the world players. Who are the countries that are really we need to watch as different things happen across the world? And so same type of layout over here, though, I did switch for you. I did lay it out so we can kind of, we're more used to talking about things in bushels. We've got billions of bushels here. And as you look across here, here's our world production. Basically, you've got the United States up here. We're still a predominant producer on the corn side. And then you'll come in here and you'll notice, so China, we, we kind of forget that China, we think of them so much on the demand side, but China's a big producer of corn and they're a big producer of wheat also. But you can see they've continued to increase on their production of corn also. And, and then as you come along down here, you'll notice a country, Brazil. Now we never used to have to talk about Brazil as it related to corn. It just wasn't something that we had to talk about, but you'll notice they continued to increase and they really started to accelerate more starting from 2010 forward. They just started increasing more and more production. And, and really what kind of drove that? So let's think back, go back with me to 2010. What did we have happening back then? Well, 2000, let's go through 2000s, what did we have? We had a whole bunch of basically demand coming from renewable energy, right? So prices ran up in 08. We had a big fall back in 2009, and then we had a number of years where we had crop problems, 2010, 11, 12, and 13, and that drove prices really high. What that caused us to have happen is that there was a big need. Prices went up. As a result, Brazil started producing more corn. And another thing happened. At that same time in Brazil, one of the big challenges they were having is that when they were planting soybeans and then they'd come back and plant soybeans in that second crop, they were having huge problems with rust. And they were trying to spray, but one of the things they finally came to is they said, you know what, um, we really need to break the cropping cycle. So if you think about kind of the pattern right now, really they're, you know, they're growing their, their corn, first crop corn, they're growing their soybeans. Those would have got planted back in September and then Actually, I did see that some of the first uh, bushels of soybeans are getting harvested now in Mato Grosso, Center Park, which is really early. Uh, normally, we shouldn't see that happening for probably another 30 days yet, but we, we are seeing uh, some per, uh, basically harvesting starting there. And that's been because of the dry conditions. They've had extremely dry conditions, and then that's causing them to get started earlier. But basically, what happens then is that after those soybeans are harvested, which get started the end of December, you know, way, all the way through March. Then in the past, they'd have followed those up with beans, but starting about 2010, they actually started coming in and planting what they call their safrina corn crop. And that safrina corn crop, uh, it's, it's kind of ironic, it makes up 75% of all their corn production. So this crop that's growing now is only 25%. It physically makes up 75%. Safrina ironically means little crop, and, uh, but it's not the little crop anymore. 
But what it's done for them, it's, it's given them a way to produce this crop and, and break that cycle so they don't have to worry about the rust on, on the soybean side. And as a result, though, they've increased dramatically in regard to their corn production. Still nowhere near where we're at, but, but you'll see the impacts of what happens when they don't have a lot of domestic demand in a little bit. Then we look at our world corn domestic demand. So you understand big picture what's going on, who are the producers, but who are the users on that corn side? Well, the big one in here, United States, but look who's coming up on us hard, and that's, and that's China. China is using a lot of, a lot of corn, and, and really if we look back and say, why have they been such a consistent user? Well, we could sum it up and say, their diet continues to change and they're continuing to eat more meat, right? Eat more protein. And when they need and want more protein, what ends up happening is that we need to feed more. Now, they've, they've increased their corn production, but they've still increased their demand also. And then we take a look, though, is that here's where we get to see some big changes happening. So on the export side, we've talked about the production. We've talked about our domestic demand. But then we think about, but... Who's supplying the rest of the world? Who's, who's doing that? Well, if we look back, so United States is here. If you look back here, keep in mind, freedom to farm coming into place in 1996, right? We had a farm bill change there, so from 96 forward, the market was dictating what we were planning. But what you'll notice right in that time frame there, we were at about 82% of the world's exports. All right, we were the driver. What happened on corn came out of the U.S. But what you'll notice overall, though, as it's continuing to go down, we got all the way down to about 20% in 2012. And what happened in 2012? Had a huge drought in 2012. Prices were extremely high in the U.S., extremely high on the futures price, extremely high on basis. As a result, we were not competitive in the world market. But if you'll notice, who was competitive in the world market? Brazil. And that's where we started to see. Brazil started to see in exports really ramped up in 12, backed off a little bit. But what you'll notice out here, there's a point in here where that orange line crossed the blue line. So in the past, we've always talked about Brazil being a major competitor of ours on soybeans. Well, they passed us this year also on corn. So now they're exporting more corn than what we are. They don't produce anywhere near what we do, but their exports are greater than what ours are. And you'll notice overall our, our role in the world exports. It's not that we're exporting less. We're not. We're exporting you know, about as much as we've ever exported. It's just that we're getting a smaller piece of a bigger overall world pie. Now, another country that we have to talk a little bit about is Ukraine. Now, unfortunately, Ukraine, because of the war that's going on there, they were on pace to continue. And at one point, you know, they were right there at number four. And there's been some years in there they were the number three exporter in the world. But uh, because of the war, they've, they have backed off some. Now, let's switch over and just kind of unpack what's going on in soybeans. World production side, what you'll notice, as you'd expect, we've got the United States, then you've got Brazil. You'll notice Brazil about overtook us in 2012. They came really, really close and tied with us in 15 and 16, and then finally overtook us for good in 2018. And their production continues to go up higher. Then along in here, Argentina. Argentina's kind of flatlined. They've had some weather problems, so they've backed off a little bit. But those are the major players. But what we have to talk about, though, is South America. We've got to understand what's going on down there. South America has a lot of production that they can bring in online yet, okay? And, that's, and I'm not talking about cutting down rainforest. It's just basically converting what they call their serrado or, or pasture ground over to production. And keep in mind, right now, round the numbers off, we, we plant corn on about 90 million acres. So with soybeans, we've got about 180 million acres in production, put wheat on there, about 220 million acres, okay? They have the ability to put into production more acres than we have in production, okay? They've got that. Now, thing we gotta think about though, let's just think about this. If it made economic sense to do that, they'd be doing it, right? 
But they've taken an additional step. The new president out of Brazil earlier this year started an initiative to say, you know what, we need to develop some of our underperforming grasslands to farm production. And so they identified 90 million acres. Now, keep in mind, we plant corn on 90 million acres. They've got 90 million acres that they want to bring into production over the next 10 years. Okay? Now, that isn't the first time we've heard them say that, by no means. However, though, what they followed up to do is they started to develop a fund to physically fund this. And so their goal is to provide low-income loans to help producers make this conversion. And believe it or not, one of the first individuals that's involved in taking part in that fund is Saudi Arabia. Now, that's basically what they're saying. Now, I believe deeply that China is involved deeply in it also, because they definitely want to see more production. So we're going to have to see a lot more of South America uh, on the production side going forward in the demand side. World soybean, domestic demand. If you're going to talk about domestic demand, you've got to talk about China. They just continue to go up and up and up. On the world soybean export, you know, we were never quite as dominant on soybeans as we were as corn, but you'll notice we're setting up there about 72%. Currently now we're setting down there about 28%, and Brazil just continues to grow. We don't see as much out of Argentina, and so it's naturally the big question is, well, why is that? Well, at least so far, Argentina had made the decision that they didn't want to ship out whole soybeans. They wanted to crush them. They wanted to turn them into soybean meal and soybean oil. And they were the number one producer of soybean meal and soybean oil. Now, we'll have to see if that's the case going forward, since they've got a new president, and this new president has a little bit different way of thinking than any of the other presidents in the past have had, but that's at least how it was. Then we look at the import side. One thing that I'll notice here on the imports, you'll notice China. China continues to as it, this represents really what we saw in their exports that we we're exporting to them, but you'll notice they are flatlining a little bit on their percentage. And basically what that's telling us is that ultimately there's other demand out there in the world that is catching up and, and, and not overtaking them by no means. They're very dominant, but there is other world growth. And that's what we continue to focus on is trying to find other markets. Now, let's change gears. Okay, so... We've painted the picture of what's going on across the world. You now have the ability to understand and see who ultimately the world players are out there on the production side. But now let's start making it a little bit more practical. Okay? And so the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about corn. Now, I brought up the December corn chart. Okay, and what you'll notice is that back in the summer when we had some concerns on drought, that corn market got all the way up to 629 and three quarters. But as quick as we went up, we fell off and came clear back down to 481. Then we rallied back up, came back down, had a nice run up, of which we thought that was the start of a longer move going forward, but it just didn't hold together, got up to 510, and then we came all the way back down, and, and I show 450 as a low, but it actually dipped below that um, on the low yesterday. So what's, what's going on in here? Well, the best way I can explain it is to just kind of show you what's going on on the supply and demand side. But let me unpack this for you. When we talk about supply and demand, there's so many numbers, right? The first thing we want to do is to say, how can we simplify it? How can we make it so that you can just focus on really one set of numbers to kind of keep your finger right on the pulse of what's going on in the market? Easiest way to do that is to come over here and start thinking about the stocks to use ratio, but let me unpack what that exactly means. So across here, starting back in 1993, these are the crop years. I have percentages here. What are these percentages of? So each month, USDA comes out with a monthly supply and demand report. In that, and we commonly call that the WASDE report, or some people just refer to it as a crop report. In that report, uh, what USDA does is they project What's the world going to produce? They project what's the world going to use. And then at the end, we have what's called an ending stock number. That ending stock number tells us how big a pile of grain are we going to have left over at the end of the year. Now, if we take that ending stock number 
and then we divide it by the total demand, we get a stocks to use percentage. Now what good is that stocks to use percentage? Well, it tells us this pile we have left over at the end of the year in relation to our overall demand, it tells us really what does that represent as a percentage. That percent, but what's the linkage between stocks to use and price? The lower your stocks to use tells us basically relative to demand, the lower amount of extra supply we have, higher prices are. The higher the stocks to use ratio ultimately is, the lower the prices will be, okay? Now let's walk ourselves back. Here's the forecast for 2023. There's 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. So what you'll notice is as we get back in here, we're getting back to levels where we'd have been back in 17 and 18 and 19. Now 2019 kicked off a big move higher in the prices because it was so wet, we didn't get everything planted, had a lot of physically prevent plant, prices ended up going higher. But if we go back in, one of the concerning things gets to be, we're building some stocks, you'll notice the world's still holding that together, but how do we relate that back to price? Well, what I did is I went back and I grabbed a monthly corn chart, okay? This monthly corn chart shows where we're sitting here today, and actually what this is showing is 447. The last time we'd have been this low on price, we'd had to go back to December of 2020. So everything that happened in here, we physically have taken away. But something that we want to think about, that stocks to use percentage, where it's useful is we can go back and say, what were the prices when we had a similar stocks to use ratio? 17, 18, 19. Well, if we come back in here, here's 2017, what price is that? 375. What prices do we hit right here? Four dollars. What did we have right here? About 450. Now, what we'd say is that if we go forward and we have no problems across the world, okay, which there will be surprises, and we would raise a big crop, where could we be in prices come this next fall? Sub four dollars, okay? Now, if we dig into that a little deeper though, there's some problems brewing out there, okay? And the problems that are brewing actually are in South America. And the South American problems that are going on down there is they are extremely dry. Now let's kind of think about their season a little bit. Okay, so basically during the year, they definitely have dry and wet periods of time, okay? For instance, in, in December, you'd expect them to get in Mata Grossa, the main central part producing area, you'd expect them to get about 12 inches of rain per month, three inches a week. Now, do they need three inches a week to great rose or grow their crop? No, they don't. Can they handle three inches a week and be okay? Oh, absolutely. Their soil is, is a lot, of the, it's a lot sandier. Even though it's not sand, it, it has a, a more structure of like sand that would, that would definitely allow that water to flow through it. What would we expect beginning during the month of November? About eight inches, about two, two inches of, of rain per week. So what's happened overall so far is that we just have not been getting enough rainfall down there. Now, what has that done for, caused them for problems? Well, it's, it's, uh, they could start planting their soybeans September 15th. That's when the government, government says September 15th, you can start planting. Why do they do that? Because they want a 90 day period of time in there when there's nothing growing, that's when the safrina corn crop is growing. There's a 90 day period in there in which they Physically, they do not want any soybeans. So they get crop planted in middle of September, but they're not completely planted yet. And what's happening is that um, as you plant that crop later, what's that gonna do? That's gonna push basically the harvest back when they're gonna be able to harvest it. And then that pushes back when they physically are able to plant that next corn crop. Now, what's the big deal about that? Why is that a problem? I mean, they can grow, the frost won't be a problem, right? Normally frost isn't a problem in Brazil unless you're in the very southern regions. But what it does is they definitely have a dry period of time. When's that dry period of time kick off? If we look at January, February, March, they'll go about nine inches of rain per month. 
as you get into February, about eight inches. As you get into March, about seven inches. As you get into April, about four. As you get into May, you could be down to basically an inch and a half. By the time you get to June, half inch. By the time you're to July, basically nothing. So if you get that corn crop planted too late, what happens? It tries to go ahead and pollinate and ear fill during a very dry season. And that's the concern. So that's what one of the things we have to watch very closely to see whether or not they're going to have a problem with their corn crop because they had a monster crop this last year. And if they would turn out and have another monster crop and we wouldn't have any crop problems, then that's where we would be back to looking at the type of prices that I was talking about, the $4, $375 to $4. Now, what could happen down there? How big of an impact? We don't know yet. We'll know in a week. One more big piece of information. There's an analytical firm out of Brazil called IMEA, okay? And IMEA, in a week, they'll announce their forecast on what do they believe is going to be the amount of corn that's going to get planted outside the optimal window for planting for the safrina crop? And what they're basing that off of is, is when does the soybean crop get planted? So we're going to have to watch for that report. So keep an eye out there in the news sources for the report from IMEA, which will give us an update on, on what do they think um, the, at least the planting of that safrina crop will be. But we're already seeing hints that they're going to physically make some changes on their corn acres. Uh, Conab is a, another analytical firm. It'd be a lot like our USDA. Conab had already been talking about less corn acres due to the profitability in South America for the safrina crop. They'd already been talking about 10 million metric tons less. That would be roughly about 400 million bushels. So. I don't think there's any way we'll get back sub $4. I think that we'll have weather problems that will come in that will keep us above that level as a floor. But the reason I brought that up to you is to really make us think we're going to have to make some marketing decisions maybe earlier this year than what we normally would. And ultimately, where on the top side? So I talked to you about the bottom side and why we could get there. But what about on this top side? Where could it go? You know, we're setting right around $5 on the DEECE of 2024 right now. If we can get $5.25, $5.30, a 30 cent bump from there, I think that's an area where we have to get some sales started on the books and start looking at that. But the other thing I would say for you, though, is that it's something that we're seeing across the board. As the markets get more and more global, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to, to make our marketing plans more robust. And what I mean by that is we're going to have to have in our marketing plans a way to physically get a price locked in, but still be able to adjust and be able to get a higher price down the road if conditions change. Because as things go more global, we know that there can be more surprises that can come at us. So basically what that means is that we're really going to have to start incorporating into your marketing plans a plan B, which a lot of times could very well be the use of options. I'm not going to go deep into that today, but the ability to make sales and come back in and defend those with some call options is something we're really going to have to look at going down the road. Now, what about soybeans? Soybeans actually look a little differently. Soybeans have a little bit more optimistic look to them, and really what it comes back to, let's go look at the stocks to use, we haven't seen what we've seen ultimately happening in corn. Our stocks to use actually were just as tight as what we had been. We had a big push up, but we're just as tight. World is better shape, but in the U.S. we're tight. And we've got a trend that's happening that in the U.S. that's actually pretty exciting on beans. And that's also the other point that makes me think we won't see corn pull back down to those similar type prices we saw with those stocks to use I've mentioned before, and that's renewable diesel. The renewable diesel industry, and immediately upon me saying renewable diesel, most people think, well, that's old news. Biodiesel, that's been around for years. This isn't biodiesel. Biodiesel has been around for years. As a matter of fact, some of the first plants got started 
right in the mid 2000s, actually early 2000s. But think about biodiesel, what did we do? We took soybean oil or fats, we took it through an estification process, we made methyl ester. That methyl ester was not chemically identical to diesel fuel, but it was close enough that it could be blended with diesel fuel. And we put it into a five to 20% blend, right? Cussed it in the winter when it changed our, our gel point, right? And, uh, but, but it got used. But now what we're talking about is renewable diesel. Renewable diesel, different process. Actually, it's very similar to making diesel fuel. You take a fat source, it, it very well could be, it could be tallow, it could be used fryer grease, could be straight soybean oil, could be canola oil, okay? And physically run it through basically a refinery. And in that refinery process, you end up with diesel fuel that's identical chemically to regular diesel that came from the petroleum process. Now, why in the world would we ever make it that way? Low carbon diesel fuel. Well, what's the big deal about low carbon diesel fuel? California, Oregon, and Washington want, they want it bad. How much do they want for low carbon diesel? They want about four billion gallons. Some would say it could be seven billion gallons. What does that translate over for what we need for basically um, crushed soybeans? To get our four billion gallons, we need roughly to crush about 80%, maybe 85% of our soybeans need to be crushed. Right now we're crushing about half of them, okay? Well, is there any steps that are being taken place to get us closer to that crushing more? Absolutely. There's about 750 million bushels of additional crush capacity on the drawing board in different parts of the, the U.S. Are any of those close to us? Yep, right up the road, David City. AGP is looking to build a facility at David City. Nebraska Crush has actually got a facility that's well under construction up in Norfolk. We're also seeing, we saw a new crush facility come online in uh, Spiritwood, North Dakota, that's crushing additional soybeans. So our crush capacity is going up, and as a matter of fact, how we track that, there's an organization called NOPA, National Oilseed Processing Association, and then their report that came out in November for the October crush, I think we crushed about 190 million bushels of soybeans. That was a new record for the month of October. It was also a new record of any month. And in addition, during the month of October, it was the first time in history that we physically used more of our soybean oil for basically renewable energy than what we did for food. So the process is changing. So we're gonna to have to watch that close, what that means ultimately locally. So what it could do is as we have Brazil wanting to produce more, we may need them to produce more if we continue to need the amount of basically domestic fuel to go into that renewable diesel. Yeah, so in South America, what we end up seeing on their rotation on corn versus beans is that because of the fact they're coming in there planting beans and then they'll come back around, they're planting corn, they'll usually come back around and plant another crop. It could be corn or it could be even cotton because there is some actual safrina cotton. So there is some rotation that does happen. Yes. So the other side, though, that we got to watch. So I mentioned renewable diesel, also sustainable aviation fuel. Now, if any of you have been watching the news, you probably show, probably saw last night, probably in your local news, what, what did they talk about? The first transcontinental flight. Now, I don't think, I, do you remember, I don't think there anybody, there was no passengers on that plane, though, I don't think. They didn't say, I didn't hear anybody say, but generally when they do those type of flights, they generally don't have any passengers on it. But because when they did that within the U.S., the domestic flight, there was nobody on it. But the, the point was the sustainable aviation fuel that uh, had the first transcontinental flight, think of it this way, what is sustainable aviation fuel? Low carbon jet fuel, okay? Uh, low carbon jet fuel. Now, is there any demand? Well, surprisingly, okay, in the US, the demand for sustainable aviation fuel 
about 37 billion gallons, okay? That'd be the amount of jet fuel if, if we did go all sustainable aviation fuel. How much is it in the world? About 100 billion gallons. So it's another major market. Now what's positive for agriculture is that we can get there through two pathways. We can get there through further refining, basically, the renewable diesel in that process, but we also can get there through the ethanol side. Now there's a little bit of debate on the ethanol side of whether or not bringing the ethanol, further using it, making sustainable aviation fuel, whether it physically qualifies for some of the incentive money out there, but I think they'll get that worked out. Now one of the concerns, I want to back up on renewable diesel, and how much time, John, when, when do we need to be wrapped up? Lots of time, okay, all right. So, so when I come back on the, re, the renewable diesel side, um, and as it relates to, the, to basically the whole jet fuel, the big thing we run into in, in that situation is that there will be a, a big battle between those two, which physically, you know, probably predominantly is used, but I, but I think they both have basically a pathway in to be used. But what I wanted to talk about on, to focus on on the renewable diesel side, one of the big concerns though, it's just like the concern we had when ethanol started, right? What if we see an administration change? Or what if the current administration decides to go another direction in regard to low carbon, right, fuel? Well, one of the positives is that this isn't what's going on in Oregon, Washington, and California isn't federally mandated. This is coming from the state, okay? So that, that's one thing. But the other side of it gets to be, we, we look at the players, okay? We look at who's involved in this and kind of say, well, what do they know that we don't know or what do they have a feel? Who's, who's making this renewable diesel? It's your major oil companies. They're physically taking some of their facilities and converting them, okay? So why are they doing that? Well, one of the reasons is they want to look more green. That's one, that's a big one. But these are big plants. I'll give you an idea. The two facilities, Martinez, California, okay? Um, think of it locally, our ethanol facilities, most of them we have outside of ADM Columbus and Cargill Blair are about 110 to 120 million gallons of ethanol production per year. The two facilities, Martinez, California, when they come online, and, and the one's partially online, they'll be producing 1.5 billion gallons of renewable diesel. So you've got big players involved on, on the production side. What about the individuals that are involved in the crush? Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of your majors. Um, you've had ADM involved in building additional crush facilities, AGPs involved. The Norfolk Crush is an a company that's not one of your majors, but they are a major that has other plants. It's not your ABCs of the green production or world. But so we look at that and say, well, it'd be different if we had individuals that didn't know anything about the industry that were stepping into it, but that isn't the case. So those are some positive things to, to happen that's unpacking that could have an impact to keep us a little tighter on the soybean side. And I think that also spills over demand-wise some and helps us probably kind of put a floor in the beans. Now, what about where bean prices could go? You know, I, I still think if we can get December or a November 2024 beans, um, 13, 13 and a quarter, I, I definitely think that's an area where we have to start making some sales, okay? Now, how could we go about, now I want to transition. So what have we done so far? Gave you a big picture view, right? What's going on across the world? Honed it in and said, now let's get a little more practical in regard to what we think is outlook and what you should do. But now I want to introduce you to maybe a little different way of thinking about when, should, when could you pull the trigger? Because honestly, the hardest part of any marketing plan is knowing when to sell, right? And, and the hard part about that is usually because we've got a fear of not producing or we've got a fear of missing out on higher prices. But I want to introduce to you one technical indicator, the stochastic. The stochastic is a momentum indicator. Think of it a lot like a uh, speedometer in your car or a tack in your tractor. Um, what it's doing is kind of giving you a pulse of what's going on in the market itself, okay? If I was looking at it on a chart, 
If you get any of our commentary, we always have it down on the bottom. You'll see it as a squiggly line down on the bottom. But, but what do those lines mean, and how do you interpret them? And how in the world could that do anything to help tell us when to sell? Well, what it really is, is kind of a measure of human emotion. And, and if you think about it, where the market goes is a lot of kind of the market psychology. It, it is a lot of what people are thinking and feeling. But let's unpack the, what, what do these lines mean a little more. Across the bottom here, I've just given us a snapshot. This is time, left or the right-hand side. This is a percentage. So how, the, how do the stochastic works is that it goes from 0 to 100%, okay, is what it, it shows. And you'll see two lines on it, two horizontal lines. At the bottom, you'll notice that there's this line at 20%, and there's one at the 80%. And then you'll also notice out of these two lines, there's a blue line that we call our percent K line, a red line, which we call our percent D line. Now, there you see the blue, there you see the red right there. Now, what that tells us is that tells us whether or not the market is overbought or oversold. So basically, if we're above this 80% level, this has told us that really from a perspective, the market's probably got higher than it really should be. Okay, it's kind of flashing some lights at you saying, be prepared to take action. If you get down here, you get above there, 80, or down below the 20, the 20 is when we're in an oversold area, basically said, it's probably went a little bit too low. So up here, it'd be a good area to say, up in here, it's flashing, hey, think about making some sales. Down here, it's flashing, hey, think about buying some if you are a cattle feeder and need to buy some. Now, as a result, that gives you a sell signal and a buy signal, okay? Let's look at, though, how would it have done back, and I've got the November futures up, how would it physically have done? Well, what I've identified in here is prices where, when you see this percent K line crossing this percent D line from the top, up above this 80% level, that'd be a sell, a sell, a sell, a sell, a sell, okay? What would that have given us overall for price? I think I get to that on another slide, unless maybe a little change we made earlier took it away, but we'll see. Um, but we say if we take that strategy, let's, let's see how it's performed. So let me walk you through what we've got. Basically, I'm looking at if we go from January through October, and if we say, okay, Let's use harvest as a baseline in here, and we're going to use the price action from January through October 15th. If we took October 15th through October 1st through the 15th, and we said that average price compared to, if we looked at what the high was and the low was, and said how would that rank from high to low during that time, here's what basically harvest prices would have been. So you can see from 2008 through 15. If you're a selling at harvest, you're basically going to sell in the bottom third. And you guys, you hear that all the time, right? Now, the stochastic, if we sold pre-harvest and just hit whenever that stochastic gave us a sell signal, how would we have done through that time? 64th percentile. Nothing else involved, just using that. If we would have said, well, let's tighten it up and go march through, and then, and then let me compare another one. Another one we usually talk about is what if we looked at just a simple March through av August average, just took the average, how would that have performed? 51st percentile. So harvest average 36, stochastic pre-harvest 64, March through August average 51%. Okay? Now that's for 08 through 15. What about from 16 through 22? Harvest, 36. Stochastic, 63. March, 51. Okay, March through August. Okay? Now, there's going to be a few challenges with doing this, and I'm going to show you in a moment, but that gives you kind of the performance. Now, if we take 08 through 2022, how does it look? Looking at pre-harvest, 36, 63, 51%. Okay? So... What we're saying is that if we compare the price from January through August 15th, we look at the high, we look at the low, right? 
We then looked at where October fell into place. It'd be in the bottom third. We look at where the stochastic fell in place, top third. March to August average, as you'd expect. An average, and any type of averaging product is gonna give you about the average. Brought you into 51%. Now, what if we expanded our window? What if we said, let's give ourselves more time? Let's not constrain ourselves just to January through October. Let's go 20 months worth of time, but let's still put August in there as a benchmark. In the 08 through 15, we threw in a, a 30%. The stochastic oscillator, I varied it a little bit. I went 75% pre, 25% harvest, okay? It brought us in basically 49th percentile. If we use March through August, 75% pre, 25% post-harvest, brought us in there, uh, that's the average, 45 percentile, and then a simple 20-month average would be about the, the 43rd percentile. So when you widen out your time a little more, one of the things that you do is because you do get a rally on that post-harvest side that could perform a little better than what you could have sometimes pre. It does knock the performance down, but it still gets you better than some of your other methods of setting price. Okay, here's the rest of your time, 16 through 22. There's our percentages. And then I go ahead and bring it all back together and look at it. So harvest, 33%, stochastic, using 75% pre, 25% post, does knock it down. How could we improve that? Sell more pre, March through August, average 46, 20 month average 45%. So, how could you incorporate that into your marketing plan? Well, if anybody's interested, I can definitely show you how you very easily can go ahead and use that and actually very easily pull that up. It, the, the stochastic indicator can be pulled up very easily on any type of charting platform that you physically use. What we find useful about it is it helps with the when to physically pull the trigger. But there is a challenge to it. And let me, let me unpack that for you. What you don't know necessarily is how many signals you're gonna get per year, okay? And that can be a big challenge. So let's walk through how many you can get. Um, 2008, there was 20 signals. Eight pre, 12 post. 2009, and, and I won't go down through all these, but what you could run into in 22 15 total sell signals, you do have six pre, and you do have about nine post. So what a perfect example would be is to use this and think, okay, so we get about six to seven pre. So if you're selling about 15% each time, maybe 20, sell 20% 20 each time, that'd prepare you for five signals but then incorporate into that the ability to come back in and buy a call if conditions change. Because here's the thing, this is taking all the, this is using emotion to know when to sell price, but it's really taking all the emotion out, okay? And if anybody would want to see deeper into the research on this, I'd be happy to share it. But what we have found now, can you make this whole process better? Absolutely you can. But I think a lot of it can very well be that the technical side, it doesn't, technicals, see, coming from the commercial grain trading background, I didn't do a lot with technicals until I got more into working with commodity markets and helping farmers market grain. Really, I'm probably a fundamentalist at heart, meaning I love the supply and demand numbers, but honestly, I find it much easier if we use more of the technicals to, to impact our selling decisions. Takes the emotion out. Okay, so what are some of our take home points? Now this is the point when you guys are getting ready with all your great questions, right? You're getting them all teed up and ready to go. Take home points going forward, the corn and soybean markets are gonna continue to be more global in nature. They're gonna be that way, we just have to accept it. Your decisions on when to sell really needs to have a technical indicator factor in there. Technical indicator, definitely take the emotion out of deciding when to sell. We're just in the process of completing and refreshing our update on, on basically the corn side. You know, you can feel free. You've got my contact info. I anticipate having 
our, our numbers updated on corn here probably within the next two weeks, and I'd be happy to share that information with you on how basically the performance would be of using that stochastic on the corn market. We'd uh, updated uh, the bean numbers before we did the corn, so uh, appreciate your patience in not having the corn numbers today. With that, I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions you guys have about anything. We kept it pretty high level today, but I just wanted to you know, share a few thoughts on what we're seeing in these markets, so yeah. Um, well, actually, for what I, from what I'm saying on the, on the low carbon diesel, the renewable diesel, actually, when they take into account everything, they're coming in at, I don't know what it is, 30% or something of what you would have on your traditional production of diesel fuel. So that's taken net, net, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've got all of them. You've got Delta, United, you've got a number of them. And that's what you're seeing the number of. Now, is it economical? <laughs> no. Does it work unless there's an incentive on it? No, it doesn't. But, but it becomes a matter of are they going to use it to market? Maybe. You know, so there, there's definitely a savings there when you net it out. But um, the challenge with just uh, like getting started is that it doesn't work without the incentive money. So, but great question. Is there money yes, there is. There's money available out there for it. Yeah, so that's, that's what keeps it moving forward. And it's not just from within the Inflation Reduction Act. There's other money available also. So, yeah. All right. Dan. Dan. It can, it'll, it'll firm it. The only thing we have to be a little concerned about, though, is that as we go forward, um, it may ch make it so that we, we really price ourselves out of uh, the export market. Or, or we may not price ourselves out of the export market because the basis levels are so much higher that it can't compete. It could be because South America has so many soybeans. And we got a taste of that this fall. The taste of that that we got this fall was the fact that Brazil's bean crop was big enough that it phys they still physically had soybeans that were exportable during our harvest. And that just had not happened to that level before. So they were right there with us. And now finally, we're at a point where we're competitive on corn and soybeans exports. Yeah, that's stochastic. Yep. Yeah. No, no, what you do, let me go back on that. So the question is, is that how do we know when to physically go ahead and make the sale? And, and what it is, and let me get back here, it's when your percent K, and you could have them flip-flop colors. The one, they could be red or blue, so you don't get too hung up on the color. You just have to dig into the charting service. It's when percent K crosses percent D. So percent K is actually the signal, and I'd be happy to share the math behind it with you. I didn't lay it out for you guys today. But basically, percent K is a signal, and this red line here, the percent D line, is just a three-day moving average. And those numbers can be tweaked, but actually the stuff right out of the box works fine. It's when they physically cross. Okay. Well, keep in mind, this is not predictive. This, this is only telling you what's it's happening. So when you see that roll over, can it roll over and then come back? Absolutely it can. That's what makes it a little bit of a challenge. But when you do see it roll over, you know, that does become a time when it's flashing sell at you. Now, I mentioned to you and I hinted that there's ways of even making it better. You should never use one technical by itself, right? But if you were to use one for everybody, this, this is a good one to have in your hip pocket.
Okay, great question. Over here. Yeah. So, so the whole thought is, is that does what role, what role can commercial storage play in your marketing plan? Really, um, there's there's probably a, a place for it, but I would try to limit it. Because here, here's how we look at commercial storage. Our preference would be if we look over a long enough time horizon, okay, and this is where I said you need to make your marketing plan so it can handle shocks. Um, eight out of 10 times, eight and a half out of 10 times, you're gonna be better off making pre-harvest sales than you are going to be selling at harvest or, or even post-harvest. So to, to take grain into town and physically make a, and, and put grain in commercial storage to wait for the market to rebound, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Only because now, it, it's not because I don't appreciate the fact that it can be hard to make some, a sale before you physically have it produced. The price of what the, your cost is gonna be to hold it in that commercial storage really make, there's cheaper ways to still get a better movement. Now, how we do look at commercial storage is that let's say we sell up to our insured level and then we bring some bushels into town because we just, we didn't have room for them if that was the case. We would look at it and say, okay, if, if the commercial storage rate, let's say is five cents per bushels per month and we think we can get an improvement in basis greater than the five cents per bushels per month, we'll use commercial storage for a while if we you know, didn't have those bushels priced. But as soon as we think the basis is narrowed enough to physically not get to a point where you aren't gonna overcome your return versus a cost, then we would switch to a basis contract. And then at that point, you're able to stop storage, you're able to get an advance on that money, stop interest, and then you're still waiting for just a little bit of move in the market. Yeah, so the big thing, okay, so, so one of the comments and questions is that recently um, China had went ahead and approved a number of basically genetified, modified you know, licenses. And what impact can that ultimately have on production? I haven't seen anybody put a number on how much they think it could increase production. I think the interesting thing about it is that it will increase production. Will it be a game changer? No, I don't think it be. will be. The biggest problem, honestly, that they have is ultimately changing the amount of farmers that they have within China. Their mechanization and what they're able to do is in production is being hurt because of the size of their farms and the number of people and, and the technology that they're able to, to basically put in place. So let's think about the scope of that problem. That problem probably is they probably have five to 600 million farmers, depending on who you listen to. Do they need that many? No. Could they get by on maybe a million? Maybe 500,000? Probably. The problem is, what do they do with all the people? And I, their hope, I think if you were able to talk to one of them and, and unpack with them and, and understand, okay, what was your plan? Well, their plan was is to have their economy stronger than what it is now and to have a need for a lot of those people to move into jobs within the country. So, no, great, great question. Any other questions as we wind her down? I'll be around for a few minutes. Anything else? Turn it back over to you, John, unless we got one.
No, I, I don't think you're too much in the conspiracy, but I, I think if, so let's just put ourselves, let's, let's put our shoes, ourselves in the shoes of a decision maker in charge of over a billion people. And, and basically, and if you're wanting to keep, what, what's the quickest way to have social unrest with people? Don't feed them. Feed them. And it's not been that long ago that they had that problem. Think of the 1950s as the last time they had major events with starvation. So what are they doing? Same thing they're doing on food is what they've done with all the other raw commodities. Secure the source. And they're continuing to try to do that more and more, no doubt about it. And the big question gets to be in South America is what role do they end up playing down there? They've invested billions of dollars into infrastructure in Brazil. And they will continue to do more and more of that going forward. You know, So no, you're, you're spot on in regard to watching China and what they're going to do to secure food. But the interesting thing about China, China has some long-term problems long-term. Look at their population. They just rolled over. They're no longer increasing in population. They're starting to, each year, decrease. So that's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to Jeff. That was really interesting. Jeff, here's your, he needs some more red coffee cups. <laughs> so, uh, a few housekeeping things. Um, talk about the, the next programs upcoming. I think we have some pretty cool topics coming up. So, the next one will be a week from today on December 7th. Um, the idea was to talk about climate since we've, we've had a couple drought years. There's, there's interest in projections for next year. So Eric Hunt, our, our climate extension educator, will talk. And then um, Katja kohler Pohl, our statewide soil health educator, is going to talk a little bit about cover crops and how how those changing systems work in, in different climate and uh, weather situations. And what I'm pretty excited about is we have a farmer panel. And Nathan has helped me secure some, some innovative people. And we're just going to have them come up and talk about the, the changes they've made in their systems. and. Um, Talking to some of those people, it's it's interesting how different rotations and cover crops and improvements in soil have have reacted in these in these dry years and in these these wild weather times. So um, I think it'll be a great session. Um, feel free to pass the word around. We'll always take more people. Um, and then we're going to take a break for the holidays. So the final session will be on January 4. Um, again, I think really interesting topics. Um, of course, nitrate in the groundwater is, is all over the news and in the, in the public. Um, so Javed Iqbal, uh, our soil fertility specialist on campus, um, he's done a lot of research in the area of nitrogen sources and timing. He has a lot of good information and in how that relates to um, nitrogen losses. So he'll speak. And then we have a gentleman from Sentinel Fertigation. Um, so we kicked that around. Not a lot of irrigators in, in Lancaster, but as we're trying to reach a, a wider audience, um, we uh, thought that was really interesting. Again, from the nitrogen management standpoint, and even if you're not an irrigator, using image-based in-season decisions for nitrogen um, seems like it 
could be a good tool for us. I think it's just, it's good to think about, even if you're not an irrigator, just more options for in-season nitrogen management. And then we also have another gentleman from CVA who um, does a lot of work in, in nitrogen management and um, has spoken at other events before. I think he'll be really good. So I think we have some some neat things coming up. Again, we hope to see you back. We hope to see a few more people. Um, um, the other thing that, that Nathan has sort of been working on and what we've been trying to explain for those of you who may not know the the general county-based extension model has changed. So in 2015, it changed over. Now we, we have more specialized educators. The old model, of course, was one county agent in every county, agronomy, econ, livestock, pasture, 4-H. Um, so now we have more specialized people. So. Nathan and I are water and crops um, in this area. Connor Beeler would be livestock. Econ would be Anastasia Meyer. She's pretty new. Um, and instead of one person in every county, most of us cover multiple counties. So I cover Lancaster, Cass Odo. Nathan has three counties. Ratika down southeast has four. Aaron has three, Jenny has three. We hired a new educator, West Central, who has nine. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's the model. We're trying to make people aware of that. Um, we have good specialists with focused knowledge who can answer your questions. So we'd like you to reach out and find those people with your questions. Um, Another thing, <clears throat> evaluations for these programs are really important to us um, for a lot of reasons. Um, for me, as we're trying to get this back up and off the ground, we really would like to have feedback on what you'd like to see, topics you'd like to learn about. The beauty of this program is it can be broad, you know. We touched on econ, we're going to touch on conservation, we're going to touch on, you know, a lot of cropping system things, but we can, we can find the topics that people want. That's, that's the purpose of this, is we try to cover what the need is for this program. So um, what we'll do is at the last session on January 4th, if, Whoever's here will give evaluations to evaluate the entire series. Um, and then if, if you're not present, we'll send them out to you. And we really appreciate any feedback. It, it helps us a lot in a lot of ways. Um, and since we have a little time, uh, <laughs> I'll get on the stump for the other things that, that go on in southeast Nebraska. Some of you may... Be aware of Nathan's um, alfalfa and wheat expos. It's in August every year. A really cool program. And as our Southeast group has started to work together, we're, we're working on, on other plans. Um, we're thinking about a pasture management expo, kind of in that same model as the alfalfa and wheat expo. Nathan and I get a lot of questions on pasture. I think Ratika will as she gets further on. Um, <clears throat> seems like there's a need in it. Uh, um, maybe not a lot of programming in it right now. So think about that. If there are any livestock producers or forage people, um, we're thinking about putting that together maybe for this coming spring. Um, the other thing that's been kicked around is an irrigation, same kind of model. Um, again, not a lot in Lancaster, but as you go up into Saunders and back west toward Jenny's country, uh, there's a lot of 
a lot of new technology <laughs> in irrigation and um, to navigate that and of course with the water quantity and quality issues there's always work to be done in irrigation so those are the things that are on tap and for me being new and Ratika being new um, please do reach out to us with thoughts with ideas any suggestions um, we need to get a feel of what the need is in our area, and we're here to help you. That's, that's our whole life. So find us, call us, email us, whatever. We love your input. And um, the last thing, on-farm research on that. <laughs> On that note, Ratika and I are working on a newspaper article right now looking for cooperators and on-farm research. Um, Jenny does a bunch of it, Nathan and Aaron will do also. It's a great way for you to learn on your own farm. Any ideas you think of that you want to test, we can do it. Randomized, replicated with statistical power on your field. <clears throat> There's, of course, some hassles and some extra work. But um, the Nebraska On Farm Research Network is a great program, great resource. So Ratika and I, especially being new, we're, we're really looking for cooperators. So um, with that, any questions for me or Nathan? I know Jeff will be familiar with this. So historically, we had the Fremont Corn Expo and then the Saunders County Soybean Expo. Both are heavily attended by both corn and soybean growers. Um, most of those are supported by the local Growers Association extension dollars and then, of course, um, exhibitors or, or sponsors. So it's, we made the decision actually to combine those uh, moving forward. So we'll have a corn and soybean expo. It's going to be January 25th this year at NREC. And then in the alternating year, it'll be in Fremont. So we're going to be moving back and forth between Fremont and NREC, and it'll be the Eastern Nebraska Corn and Soybean Expo. So that'll be the new model on that. We'll have the Alfalfa Wheat Expo, hoping to expand. And that kind of covers those two crops and then hopefully the pasture. So our goal is collectively as educators, instead of each doing our own thing, to try to coordinate with each other to offer a suite of programs that cover all the programs for a broader region versus just necessarily down to the county. So you have to travel a little bit more maybe, um, but we hope you'd have a, a more robust program and a, a better program for you to attend. Yep. Sounds great. We appreciate the, the comment. Perfect. Yep. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah, we're really excited about the the opportunities in pasture. So we'd love to get that started. Um, big thanks to Jim Weiss. We couldn't have streamed this. This is this is a great luxury in Lancaster County to have Jim and the ability to stream this and record it. It's incredible. Um, this recording will be available on YouTube if you want to go back and check it out or send it to your friends. That would be great. Also, Karen Wedding, who isn't here, but she really keeps me in line. We'd probably be sitting on the floor throwing dice or something if she wasn't here. So, big thanks to her and all the people in this office to help put this together. So we'll wrap it up. Hope to see you next week. And thanks again for coming. And thanks to Chris and U Farm. We really appreciate our sponsors. So have a good day. Come find us if you'd like to visit. And we'll see you next week.